guys, well, uh, first of all, welcome Tom Bayer. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you having taken the time to come and share with us. Sure. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, welcome everybody here. Just obviously, if you don't know Tom, Tom Bayer, he's the author of uh, the the uh, world famous football starts at starts at home book. Uh, a great reader, definitely recommend it. Also, a football consultant, early year specialist, so really specialising in the the first steps of football that players take. And works with has worked with the China FA and many other FAs, and currently working with Houston Dynamos. Uh, so really excited uh, to have you on. Uh, and something really new we haven't really talked about uh, during these webinar series. So without further ado, take it away, Tom. Let's uh, get stuck in. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sal, for um, for inviting me on. I'm a big fan of your work. Um, as you know, we met a few years back. I think it was in Geneva when I did a presentation um, for a pretty big group uh, made up of UEFA coaches. Um, and we've uh, we've kept in touch ever since. So. I follow this. I follow your webinars, and uh, you've had a bunch of my friends on as recent as well, like even Chris Vanderhagen and Romeo Jozak. Um, so I'm honored to be uh, in the presence of some of these uh, these football specialists. So what I'll do is I'm going to let's see if I can turn yeah. on the screen share. Uh, allow. Okay. And tell me, just give me some feedback and let me know my thing is working. Is it working? Yeah, all good. Perfect. Okay, how does this page look? Okay, or should I so, need? So yeah, if you go, yeah, you go press play. Yeah, if you press play. Yeah, then I'll go into the whole thing. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Well, first, I thought you know it's always good to kind of go through first and give a little bit of background of my you know who I am, where I come from, um, what what are my experiences that have shaped me into what my beliefs are. My career has evolved significantly um, over the years, um, like I think a lot of lot of, lot of coaches or people involved in the game do. I'm originally from New York, um, but I've lived majority of my adult life has been in Japan, in Asia. Um, I was born in the Bronx, New York City, uh, then moved upstate New York. I went to a community college in upstate New York, which was a, a again in America they call it soccer, but it was a, it was a, a national perennial powerhouse back in the 1970s and 80s. Um, two times national champions, and then I went to the University of South Florida, um, and I, I wound up over in Japan. I played at um, Hitachi, which was pre J League, um, and it's funny because I had the distinction. I I was the first foreigner to ever play uh, on Hitachi, uh, and the second foreigner was uh, Kareka. He came actually to join when the J League started. Um, I'm not saying I'm any correct, correct, that's for sure, but just to show you <laughs> the transition and how, how Japanese football transformed. Um, you know, many people have, and it's great, you know, today we're talking to you here, you know, in the UK. Um, many people, and I'm sure yourself as well, um, have had lots of mentors um, throughout their career. And basically, Paul Mariner, uh, former England great, um, 1982 World Cup in Spain, scored two or three goals. Um, he was a pro prolific goal scorer in his day, played for Ipswich Town and also Arsenal. Paul had a massive influence on my career because Paul got me interested and then introduced me to the work of Will Curver. And to this day, I am in constant contact with Paul, literally almost on a daily basis. So Paul got me interested in the in the curver stuff, and I I was the guy who basically brought that methodology out here to Japan, and I ran the commercial business of uh, curver coaching here in Japan for about fifteen years, and that's a, it's the largest <laughs> commercial football business, not just in Japan, but could be perhaps in the world. It's it's a massive program out here. So so technical, I, I basically became a technical coach. That's my background. That is what I see football through, the kind of lens, so to speak. So I'm purely a technical coach. I do have experience coaching actual teams. I was for 10 years the under-12 national select head coach for the Japanese under-12 team. Um, it took them overseas to play in many tournaments. But my roots and my foundation and my, my perspective really comes out of uh, technical coaching. Now... I work with many different brands. Um, I've been very fortunate. This is a, 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 a picture of me from over 30 years ago, back in 1989. Um, and actually, in 1988, I pitched the idea to Nestle um, to sponsor a series of football 
clinics we call. And again, the long story short version is, is that um, I convinced Nestle to sponsor these events. Um, and I would I wound up leading this movement or this program in Japan for 10 years. So I've got a lot of experience in working with different brands, um, working with different media groups, and I'll show you different parts of that. Here it is. So when I got involved and I really became interested in the, the technical uh, acquisition of skills um, and teaching and learning it, I wanted to introduce this, this concept to Japan. Um, so here's kind of what we call Omni Media Approach. It's, this was done really by trial and error back in the 1990s, whereas today, fast forward, 25 years, 30 years, I, I, we do, I can do this by design because I understand it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, what I do now, more as a consultant or an advisor. <laughs> but basically, think of all of these little tabs here, animation, schools, I'm talking commercial schools. Internet had just come about back then too. Events, television. Um, I was very lucky and I was casted on Japan's number one TV show for children, which is not a football show. It's a show for pop culture that was born out of the Pokemon craze. And I had a football corner on there. Newspapers, magazines, I'm talking about football magazines. Manga, that's comic books. Products, I'm talking about in the old days, VHS videos, DVDs, today apps. So we used all of these delivery mechanisms to deliver the same relentless message here in Japan. And that is, if you wanna be a good football player, it all starts with the technical component. So what we did was, we created a movement here in Japan where we put out so much content of the technical stuff, technical skills, to basically try to create a culture of understanding here in Japan at the foundation phase, the early entry level and competitive level, where, 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 where players would focus on the technical component. And there's no doubt about it now, fast forward now 25 years later, and we have definitely had a major influence on Japanese football, um, especially if you want to consider the women's game, which is a really an outlier in football because Japan women's team or program is the only country in the world that's won all three FIFA championship uh, competitions. No country in the world's ever done that. Even in the U.S. where we've won four senior World Cups and four Olympics, haven't won the under-17s or the under-20s. Japan won the, the senior FIFA World Cup, the under-20 World Cup, and the under-17 World Cup in the space of seven years, okay? Which is quite, quite remarkable. And the reason why Japanese are so good is because it, they basically focus on ball mastery, okay? Ball mastery at the entry level and at the foundation level, <laughs> and also because of the Japanese culture too, it's a very possession-based type of football that they play. So I've done over 2,000 events um, for half a million kids. So just imagine that. that That's a lot of kids, man, half a million children. And basically the theme of those events were always one ball and one player and showing kids what they could do with that ball to improve their technical skills, starting out with ball mastery, then starting out with teaching what we call change of direction moves cutting, turning, then stopping and starting. Then also moves to beat opponents. You've got three different types of 1v1 where the defender's in front of the player, the defender's alongside the player, the defender is behind the player. So those all take different solutions to try to get out of those 1v1 or, or to pass a player to create more space and, and more time. And then also teaching kids from a very, very young age how to protect the ball. So as you can imagine, on any given weekend, I would be traveling around Japan doing these huge events, um, usually on average 300, 400 kids. Um, this is a very interesting slide because in the back you can see the word Canon. Canon was another one of my corporate sponsors that I worked with for about 11, 12 years. And that person in the yellow, that's a woman. Her name is Tak uh, Asako Takak uh, um, Takakura. And that, at the time, she was my assistant doing all of these events, and she turned out to become the under-17 Japan national team head coach. She, that exact year that we're doing that event right there, she went to the World Cup in Costa Rica and won the World Cup. And her team scored 23 goals and allowed one. 
okay? And she's also now currently the head coach of the senior women's team as well. So I've known her for years since she retired. So I've been very lucky in my career to be able to work with both players and coaches. And I've seen their transformation from starting out as young kids, becoming professional players, going into coaching and playing professionally and winning World Cup tournaments. So that's a very, very kind of a, 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 um, unique insight that I see of what it's taken for people to start out at the grassroots level and go to the pinnacle of our game, which is winning World Cup tournaments or even qualifying for World Cup tournaments. So again, just going around the country, doing these events. One of the other fortunate things is because I was the football ambassador for Adidas for many, many years out here in Japan, 20 years in Asia in general, 25 years. Anytime any of the big players from uh, Adidas assets, so to speak, would come to Japan, they would almost always wind up at my events. And, and the reason this is important, Sal, is it, it's a very important reason is because also I go around I was uh, the technical advisor consultant to the AFC, which is our confederation, the Asian Football Confederation. So I go around to a lot of federations trying to, you know, show them, okay, well, why has Japan been so successful? And the reason I have this picture out here, um, other than obviously it's always pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty nice to be able to stand next to a guy like this, but I'm trying to show countries how you can take a grassroots figure like myself who never had a really huge playing career and elevate my status to be taken more seriously. So anytime you can get on a pitch with a guy like, you know, Zidane or whether it's David Beckham or, or Pogba or, or some of these players I've, I've worked with, then I'm taken more seriously. So I, I try to teach, you know, uh, uh, federations, state associations, professional clubs, how important it is to try to elevate the guys or the women that are working in the grassroots segment. Uh, and this is one way of doing it. Also using, um, you know, I was casted on Japan's number one TV show called Ohasta back in 1998. And this was born out of the Pokemon craze. So it was the producers of Pokemon. Now this is not a football show. This is a show, it, it's just pop culture. But this was kind of the opening of the show just to show you how we can use pop culture to try to popularize football. I don't know if you can hear the sound um, but you'll see the visuals. It's a very short clip. So every day this corner would open up. People ask, what is that 106? It's a long story short. In Japanese, in the Chinese characters, 106 spells out my name, Tom. So just a play off on that. So basically this corner would go every single weekday morning, Monday through Friday. It would start at 6.45 in a minute. It had a 5% uh, viewership, which is, means 5 million households per day. Um, I did over 3,000 of, uh, of these corners in Japan. So again, you can imagine it's on national TV. Um, so we influenced the whole generation of children. We also went to a, a, a couple of the, the football magazines and convinced them to give us several pages every month in their football magazines. So this is a, a, a magazine that's very popular for children. So regularly we'd have several pages here talking again about the importance of technique, technique, technique. So everywhere you look, we're doing events, we're doing TV shows, we're creating content, VHS videos, DVDs, we're in the print. So everywhere you look, we're somewhere that we're there right now. Let me see here. Let me go ahead of myself here. Sorry. I'll go back. Okay. So this brings us into that. That was kind of the before I like to say kind of uh, the uh, my day job in the olden days. And this presentation that I have, usually I've got 197 uh, slides, but don't panic. I'm, I'm halfway through the, the, the this part of it, but I'm just trying to give people a kind of a, a background of of where I came from and how I arrived at what I'm gonna show now. And this is, this is really what I do around the world today is I travel around the world. I'm invited to some of the biggest club teams in the world, some of the biggest federations in the world. And I present what I call, sorry, this is the, the latest I, this, uh, one that I use in the US. So I've got the word soccer, I usually have football, but basically football starts at home. So to really quickly tell the audience, what is this? 
basically what happened is, is that back in around 2006, um, I was doing an event for Adidas and I was signing those little miniature balls as, and giving them away as autographs for Adidas to only a select few kids. And while I was literally holding the ball, I call it the proverbial apple, but the proverbial ball, my first son had just started walking. And I thought, small ball, small foot, small child. So I asked Adidas to send me a few of these balls and a big box, a case arrived. And I put a ball in every room because I had so many of them. There were about 20 of them. So what I did was, because I'm a technical coach, I discouraged my son from kicking the ball. And I encouraged him to do more of this ball mastery pulling the ball back, right foot, left foot, basically made that ball part of the environment, basically made that ball the favorite toy. And what I started to see was, was quite amazing because I could see this like learning curve of how interested he was becoming in it, how proficient he was becoming in it, how he would model what it was that I was doing. And I could see that I was actually using the home as a very good developmental tool. And it wouldn't have been until a little bit later, and I'll go through it, that I started understanding the science involved in it as well. So if you think about it, the entry level for the sport is usually kicking and shooting of the ball. So if you go to a park, usually even in the UK or many places in the world, you'll find the parks are often filled with parents and kids, and they're basically kicking the ball back and forth or they're in front of a goal and they're shooting. But the reality is, is that kicking is usually the entry level. But what I started to do was, again, I started the program with my kids, you know, non-competitive home environment. What happens is, is that the home is considered a very safe, protective environment where a kid can try anything and they don't have, there's no pressure on them to be successful. So the, the, the home becomes a crucial development tool. But here's what I call the gift for families. It's the parent's understanding of the child's need for parental approval. That's what creates the magic. Now, it doesn't have to always happen inside the house. It could be outside. But when a child, when a child is searching for that parent's parental approval, parental attention, parental praise, that creates an electrical chemical process in the body, in the brain, which is emotions. So when you can create an emotionally charged environment, that's where deep learning and long-term memory takes place. The body is the unconscious mind. And it was wonderful to see uh, my good friend Romeo Jozak's presentation the other day because he was talking about how skills are basically, it's, it's, it, it's an unconscious movement. And he's absolutely correct. So the way that you can basically upload those technical skills is by repetition. And again, you know, I know there's lots of, there's lots of um, debate about this isolated training, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is the football world has not caught up to what science already knows. And that is, is that skill acquisition happens much, much, much earlier than everybody supposed. So what's happening is, is that just think of it, for example, right here. My son is basically, this is an e emotionally charged environment because he's doing this to try to please me as well. But here's another gift. And I learned this from the neuroscience guys, Dr. John Rady, who wrote the forward and the afterword for my book, one of the foremost neuropsychiatrists in the world from Harvard Medical School. The part of the brain that's responsible for ball mastery is the cerebellum. The cerebellum was thought to be only responsible for motor functions. Okay, motor skill uh, of these motor skills. But the recent neuroscience of today, they know that the cerebellum is responsible for much more. It's responsible for thinking. It's responsible for remembering. It's responsible for controlling emotions. It's responsible for decision making, responsible for reading and responsible for what we call single digit mathematics. Okay, now the feet are the furthest distance from the brain. So we have very few opportunities to build the neural pathways. So what's happening is when you watch that repetition, what's happening in the neuroscience world part of it is that you've got, you've got cells that are firing and wiring together. And the more repetition that you have, the more and the stronger the neural network becomes, the neural pathways. 
So that's where in the unconscious uh, subconscious brain, basically those technical skills are being stored to be later used in a very unconscious, automatic, automated way. That's just the science. That's not me talking about it. You can, you can understand that by talking with the neuroscientists about that. I'm involved in some, some uh, very innovative, um, really groundbreaking research. I uh, can't tell you too much about it, but I can just tell you that we're doing some things in this area um, that's going to be very, very, very interesting that hopefully uh, the results are, or the um, outcomes we'll be able to share in the next couple of months. And I'm working with some of the, a couple of the top universities in the world with some of the best professors of research in the world as well. So here, this was my son here that you just saw. Now this was just my son during the COVID lockdown, just messing around the house. Now, a lot of people kind of, you know, over, over these last couple of months, they're sending me messages of kids practicing that are, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old at home. And that's great. I'm all for it. And I think that you're doing it. But what we are presenting is a bit different. What we're talking about, and I'm always for everybody practicing as much as they can. But again, what we're talking about is, is, is harnessing the influence that a parent has with a child from a very, very young age. And I'll show you more. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll, sh I'll show you when we're talking about it. So again, uh, sorry. Again, using the house. And what happens here, Sal, is that when a child can learn a skill, let alone a football skill, that's a feeling of empowerment. That's a self-belief. That's confidence. That you can bring into a science or a mathematics test. Because what's happening is, is when kids, before they cross over the line into organized play, if they have some level of technical comfort with the ball, there's a, there's a bias that manifests. You, you, you always hear about the relative age effect. Well, it's almost like a technical relative age effect because what happens when a six-year-old shows up to his first practice and he or she is technically very good, that kid normally or naturally become very popular because the other kids want to pair up with the best kids. Also the coach is usually going to ask the better kids to demonstrate. So now you've got a six-year-old or a seven-year-old being asked by the coach to demonstrate. So now they're getting an opportunity very early at leadership. So that's a very, very, very big, big impact on a child from a young age. So now, if, you're, if your viewers can see this, this is my son when he's 11. He's right there in the center with the red shirt on. And if you can see, the ball is up in the air. It's up there kind of by where the, the corner of the goal is. Now, that's mathematics. This is the result of ball mastery. He is already measuring the trajectory, the distance, the angle, and the speed of the ball. And the ball's gonna come down and this is what happens. And again, that's from ball mastery. Now. That's just my kid. Now, this is a little girl, Jocelyn, whose father contacted me several years on Twitter, I believe it was, DM'd me, and he asked me for some advice. I started sending some videos, um, and he put a plan in place for his little daughter, Jocelyn. I believe she was five years old. So let's watch here. This is Jocelyn on the left side. And for any coaches or any technical coaches to watch this, this is a very, very difficult movement to perfect or to master. Players like, players like uh, Iniesta, Xabi, Messi, these guys are so good at this move. And this move can be taught. It can be encouraged. What's the, what's the time difference between when she started and that video there, Tom? Yeah, well, she started when she was five, and here she's seven. And now you're going to see, you're going to see on the right hand side, she's seven years old, I believe, here. And you're going to see her put it into play now. Oof. 
Now, here's a program. Here's a kid that we have down in Australia on the left side. 15 week, we call it a 15 week challenge. This is this is day number one. Inside his house, we set these we set these programs up. We've done it with hundreds of children. And basically, we encourage parents to work with their kids. 15 to 20 minutes. We have a we have 15 of these groups going on in Houston. This is in Australia. 15 to 20 minutes per day, if possible. Okay, now on the right hand side, this is the 15th week. So you can see the progression, you can see the transformation. Now you 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 can't tell me that a, a child that's starting off at that entry level or the early phases isn't gonna be better off than the kid not doing it. I mean, you know, I don't even think that's debatable at this point. Now here, just a couple more slides. This is to show you, I work with a, a different professional clubs as well. This is uh, uh, Beijing Guan, which is one of the super clubs in the uh, CSL, Chinese Super League. And I set up two different, three actually, different programs. Um, th one was at uh, five elementary schools, one was with the club, and then also one was with five kindergartens as well. So I worked with the, the Chinese Ministry of Education and the, and the Beijing Bureau of Education as well for several years um, because they've got what's called the Chinese School Football Program, which has 50,000 schools that are designated football schools. So I created the technical uh, curriculum for their whole national program for the 50,000 uh, 50, schools. I created a, a, a television corner as well for them. Now, this is an interesting slide because it, this is a six-year-old boy. This boy is six years old. Now, the, 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 reason that that, the reason that that slide is very, that video is very important is because we're showing also how we can use football and ball mastery in particular to basically help to build children's confidence up, their self-belief. Now, if we threw that little boy, little boy, he's, he's a big boy, but he's six years old. If we threw him into a mini game or an 11 aside, the whole thing's finished. Doesn't touch the ball. He, he, he's, he's got no success. Kids are laughing at him because I've, we've seen it. We've done it. But here, that big boy who's six, he in his own mind, he believes he's a football player. So again, it's self-belief. It's basically trying to help kids using football to develop. So I've got lots of experience working with brands, Volkswagen Group. I was their football ambassador for all of China for, uh, for Volkswagen, designed programs for them. Also AIA Insurance, which is the second largest insurance company in the world, um, designed programs for them in Asia. Um, so again, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm trying to give you know, people watching this, where, what my experience is. I, I've sat in, I've sat it, I've, I've run the gauntlet where I've sat in the <laughs> boardroom with CEOs and presidents of the biggest companies of the world and basically convince them to build strategies around our ideas and invest big money into it as well. So for me, it's really all about empowering parents. Parents to me are by far the most important if you're looking at the different phases of development. Because what happens at the entry level can often dictate the entire trajectory for a child, whether they have a good experience, a bad experience. If you look at a country like America, 38.5% of children who play football in America quit by the age of seven, and then another 50% quit by the age of 10. So imagine you have a business and you're losing 50% of your customer base every year. Okay. And what are people doing about it? Not much. Because many have have not understood how very young children develop. The football world has virtually ignored them. The people who should know better have ignored them. And when you look at these national curriculums that are set up, usually, more often than not, the discovery phase, which is basically the ages between six and nine, that's the first time a child comes on the radar screen for most federations. Between the age of six and nine, they build the characteristics of a child. They say lack of motor skills, short attention span, clumsy. So they recommend play fun games related to football. 
So when you look at this neuroscience, and, and like I say, football hasn't caught up to what science knows. Skill acquisition happens much, much earlier than nine or 10, in the, 10 years of age. But also what happens is, is that we're empowering parents to help their kids. And that in turn develops a deeper family relationship, appreciation, gratitude, respect, admiration, love. Um, and that's what brands are interested in. So that's how also it's a, a, a clever way if you know how to speak the language of some of these different brands that are investing millions and millions of dollars in the football. But most of the time, they just want to put money into uh, tournaments and things. So here we go around and we do what we call ignition events. This is parents. It's usually 90 minutes. I do a much longer in-depth presentation than I'm doing now, but it's targeted towards moms, dads, grandmothers, grandfathers. This is the first phase to ensure that basically as, as, um, as, uh, as, as, as Todd being was said so nice about my work, he said, uh, football starts at home is basically getting kids off to a flying head start. That's what it is for parents, getting them off to a flying head start. And that's what we try to do before a child ever shows up to his, his or her first ever training session. If they're comfortable with the ball and they've mastered the basics, stopping, starting, turning, cutting, changing direction. Protecting a ball, that's a game changer. So here also um, created a, uh, a television corner in China, Chinese educational TV, um, over 100 million households per day, um, together with David Beckham. Uh, I, designed, I designed all the content, I directed it, and I appeared in it. And basically, David just opened it up. So now kind of transition a little bit into... Um, what we call soccer starts at home. It could be football starts at home, but this is, I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse into Houston, what we're doing. So I have a three-year contract with the Houston Dynamo. Um, I'm in my second year now. The first year was basically showing up. I, I, they fly me from Tokyo to Houston four times a year, every quarter, and I spend between seven to 10 days there. So the first year basically <laughs> was going around to all of the major stakeholders in the game um, in the Houston, Texas area and showing them what the program was to try to rally and get support. And there's lots of stakeholders, man. It's not just coaches. Everybody makes the mistake and they think it's only about coaching, but it's not. It's coaching. It's the sponsors. It's the media. It's families. It's different brands. It's the t uh, educators. It's everybody has a stake in the game here. Now, before I go any further here, there's another series that we filmed for uh, in down in Australia for a, a cell phone company called Optus, which had the, the, the uh, broadcast rights for the 2018 World Cup. They came to us and they said, can you figure out some way that you can tie your football starts at home together with some star players? And I said, sure can, because I do a lot of research on players. So this was the common denominator amongst the world's best. All of these players, Eden Hazard, Harry Kane, Tony Cruz, Lionel Messi, Neymar, Pogba, Rodriguez, Cristiano, Luca, also missing here, Iniesta, um, Suarez as well. All of them, all of them started engaging with a ball, usually a small ball, between the ages of two and five years of age. And all credit their fathers and sometimes their mothers with their love and their early success for the game as well. And if you look at most of the big, big, big stars in the world, you'll find the same thing, early age uh, engagement. So here, this is uh, Houston Dynamo the, uh, for, on the far right post there. That's Paul Holleher, who is the technical director of the club. The guy standing next to me on the right, that's Tab Ramos, the head coach, also former captain of the U.S. national team, brilliant player, um, great player, one of the real good technicians of American soccer, if there ever was one. And, that, and the other assistant. So when I started this program with the Houston Dynamo, I told them that I would only do this program if I could get the complete buy-in from the entire organization. So our Football Starts at Home presentation has been seen by every single employee that works in that club. Everybody from the president to the guy or woman who's taking care of, t of selling the tickets and also grooming the field outside on the stadium. They all, because everybody needs to be uh, understanding on, on how we develop players. So we go around in Houston as well, and we create these ignition events. We go into schools. A big, big, big part of our program now is we work with schools. And here's the reason why. 
because again, I, I said before, but because the part of the brain that's responsible for ball mastery is the cerebellum, it has tremendous cognitive, emotional, and physical benefits as well. So we know, or the, the science or the neuroscience world knows, that kids that are involved with ball mastery, regardless whether they become football players or not, this is a very important point, regardless of that, it's still a very good what we call cerebral training of the brain. So it creates better thinkers, better memory, controlling emotions, and, and I'll tell you why. Because when kids involve in ball mastery, one ball, one player, especially if you saw the videos of my kids and the younger kids when they're three, four, five years old, ball mastery takes a certain degree of focus. It takes a certain degree of concentration and takes a certain degree of, of, of discipline. So what's happening is, is that that's really what, what comes down to uh, modulating the brain, calming down the child. If you think about it, usually what happens when you put a ball next to a little three, four, five, six-year-old, they'll run around chasing it, kicking it, and falling over. So this is a, puts them in a more meditative, calming state. And also what happens is if you were to basically conduct training with kids uh, in ball mastery, and you were to then later on examine them with an fMRI, okay, a functional MRI, basically what you'll see is you'll see a much more coherent brain that's functioning. You won't see, just see one side lighting up. You'll see a very cohesive brain. So that's basically incredibly biologically. It, 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 you, it, it's, it, I'm not an expert in it, but I'm around enough of the experts that I'm understanding it. But what they say is, is that the brain works more th smoothly. So this, is, uh, this has uh, big implications for education as well. So we have a program in Houston now. Um, and, and, and in the summer school as well, we've got 40,000 kids that are going to participate in this program. And what they're going to do is while they're doing summer school, they are going to be getting up and doing exercise ball mastery uh, with, the, with their feet. So it's a very exciting, innovative program that we're doing. But in order for the success of this, we have to engage and educate the parents, the, the stakeholders, PE teachers, uh, administrators um, alike. So here, this was my last meeting at, um, in Houston the, the uh, day before I came back. This is at the Houston Mayor's Office, at Director of Education, to basically show them what our program is. And that, in turn, they turned around and offered up uh, 17 different school districts for us to work in. Now, this is to show you, I think this might be the last slide. This will show you the level of the commitment from the Houston Dynamo. When I was back, this was right before the season was going to start, before the whole COVID-19 started. But this was Fan Appreciation Day. Now, this stadium was pretty packed, but where the scoreboard is, there's not that many people. But the point is, this is the commitment that they have to the program. So that was that was quite, um, you know, satisfying when I saw that that level of commitment because they're on. I, I'd seen the president, John Walker, that day after I saw that billboard up there or I saw the t a TV screen. And I said to him, uh, I said, wow, John, really appreciate it. And he said to me, listen, we, we are all in. We are all in on this program. So you got to remember. This is what we're, and that, that's the, that's the, my presentation. Um, I can, hold on, let me see here. Close this. I can turn off. Okay. I, I think I turned it off. I think we're maybe back to normal yeah. now here. Yeah. That's so right. that's just a little glimpse. I mean, I kind of went through it pretty quickly, but um, that's basically where, where, where we're at, you know, and that's a lot of the work. I'm, I work in many different countries. I got to be honest with you, I, I literally almost can't supply the demand of how many, how much people um, or groups, professional clubs, leagues, brands, um, there's not enough days in the week, to be honest with you, to service. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful time for me right now because I really enjoy what I'm doing. And I feel like 
I'm making uh, the most contribution that I could compared to what I did in the olden days. And I did a lot in the olden days with kids and media and TV and, and events and things. But this is my passion now. For me, it, it, it's all about it because we've got three distinct levels everybody has to understand. You've got the entry level. That's where we're at. Then you have the competitive level. A kid joins a team, six or seven years of age, trains a couple times a week, competition on the weekends, has a positional play, coach, starting man, blah, 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 blah. And then you have the elites, you know, the professionals or whatever country you're doing. And it's really those three. And for me now, looking at everything I've done over 30 some odd years, again, I'm, I'm biased about it perhaps, but for me, it's as clear as the nose on the end of my face. The entry level to me seems to be the most important. And especially for developing countries, if they're looking to really, you know, the, the best way to develop the top players in any country in the world is by closing the gap between the very best players and the least developed, especially with the kids, especially with the kids. And I'm talking 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old. And the problem is that most countries, they have good players, but the gap between the very best and the least developed is like the Pacific Ocean. And that's what happens. So when you look at those good countries, whether it's the South Americans or let's go, there's only eight countries in the world that have won a World Cup tournament. Uruguay, Brazil, Argentina, Germany, Spain, Italy, France, and England. That's it, man. And then you see the other countries that are knocking on the door. It's the Croatians. It's the Belgians, right? It's the Dutch. It's a certain amount of countries, but it's the same, more or less, it's the same repeat serial winners every time. Man. So for me, it's culture plays a much, much bigger role, but especially at that entry level. So I'll cool. come up for air so, now. <laughs> yeah, good. So we've got lots of questions here. Just, uh, I've got a couple first. Just, just go over that a little bit. You mentioned it briefly. You talked about um, normally the entry level being players kicking a ball. And yep. you, you try and discourage that. Just tell us a little bit more about that and your thought process behind that. Yeah, well, what happened was is a couple of things. You know, I started observing, you know, like I said, I, I ran a lot of, I ran, the, you know, one of the biggest commercial football school businesses in the world is here in Japan, man. We, to this day, 20,000 players, turns over about close to 25 million US dollars a year, 200 full-time staff. And the reality is, is that the best players in our schools, we inherited them. They already come to us very good. So I started looking and studying and also going around and looking at other countries and reading biographies of players and started to realize that the best of the best had such good command mastery of the ball and to study and see what their, what their, what, what, what their development phase was. But it just makes sense, even with my own kids. If you're teaching a small child to constantly kick the ball that's not laying down any kind of neural pathway. It's, it's basically conditioning a child to get rid of the ball, whereas I know that it's a passing game. There's no doubt about it. But, but what is the most difficult part of the game is basically holding on to the ball and protecting it and dribbling it. When you look at any team, whether it's Barcelona or any team that's even a good passing team, they've got some of those schemers that are the best dribblers in the world. So it just only makes sense that if you're constant, and also you read a guy like Pep Guardiola in, the, in his books, what it says, there was a question asked to him, what kind of players do you look, look for when you're recruiting? He says, regardless whether they're a defender, a midfielder, or a forward, I only look for one thing. Can they dribble? Can they dribble? And if they can, that's the player that I want because teaching, passing, receiving, combination play, the other parts of the game are much, much easier to teach and develop. Interesting. And uh, just tell us a little bit about also, we've had this discussion before. So just why do you think it often that there's so much resistance to ball masteries, particularly from the scientific community, many of the coaching community who are also, you know, more maybe science from a science background. And there's almost like a resistance to doing anything away from game training. Well, to be honest with you, I don't really believe that it's a big majority of people. I got to be honest with you. I think it's like with almost any kind of, um, you know, discussion about, you know, what's right and what's wrong. A lot of the time, the minority, the people in a minority seem to make most of the noise. But I think what it is, too, is that people look at skill acquisition and they couldn't wrap any kind of metrics or any kind of science behind it because it's really observation, right? 
And so it was very difficult for them to measure. But the reality is, and again, and I'm talking from a, a, a experience of working with literally half a million kids and basically working as a technical coach. Most coaches aren't technical coaches to begin with, but I've seen it. So for me, I don't really need to have any kind of like validation from someone or an argument before with someone because I know what I know because I've done it. I've seen it. I've worked in that space for 25 years of technical development. I've seen kids that basically enter into the entry level and they play mostly just mini games. They just play games, games, games. And after six years, I've seen almost little to no development. And I've also seen in the same group kids that entered in to the entry level who are already technically proficient and technically comfortable with the ball and see how they develop from six years of age to 12 years of age. So here's, here's, my, here's my science that I say, okay? The player who crosses over the line into organized play that's technically competent already, that person paired with the inexperienced coach, that kid will always develop, at least until the age of 12, 13. It's the kid that crosses over the line into organized play that has absolutely no technical ability that's unfortunately paired with the inexperienced coach that's the kid that's in the parameters of the 38.5 percent that are quit by age of seven and the 50 percent that age by 10. that's reality and if you look at also the number of kids quitting of course there's many reasons they point their rifles at the coaches the parents no majority of kids that quit are technically poor and they don't enjoy it. So, of course, they just don't have fun. Interesting. Here's a question from Jordan. He says, how do you address... Uh, no, sorry, there's one. That's this one for Matthew, sorry. Uh, what's Tom's opinion on soccer clubs in the US having junior programs aimed at two to six-year-olds? I work for a club in MA doing junior classes for two to six-year-olds as part of my job. It's just a club... Is it just clubs trying to make a quick $100 plus? Yeah, that's a great question. And I get, I get off of that. I don't... I don't... I don't um, encourage uh, setting up schools for two, three, four, five, six-year-olds. I just don't. What I believe that football starts at home, falls in the context of families, not teams. Now, having said that, having said that, I don't think it's a minus. I just don't necessarily would not set those kind of schools up myself. I wouldn't be an advocate for it. But here's what I would say. Let them do what they're doing in those schools because it's just good for the kids to just run around. You've got social development. The kids are out in the fresh air. They're running around physically. But here's, the take, here's what I believe. You, parents have to understand that that is not going to develop your kids. That's not a developmental pathway. Therefore, you have to understand that you have to supplement it. So for me, it's much more important what's happening away from that organized training than what's happening inside. My kids went to a school like that here in Japan. My kids entered into their first school when they were three years old, three, four, and five. I wrote a whole article on gold.com about it a few years ago. You can find it online. I wrote a whole story about it. So what happened was is that at, at my son's kindergarten, here in Japan and in China, they go to kindergarten for three years, not one year. And that kindergarten had an outsourcing program for kids to play football. So my kid joined because my wife's friend's kids joined. So they went and it was just running around. There was almost not, no development that took place at all, at, at all. But by the time my son, both of my boys, entered into organized play by the age of six, they were technically uh, proficient because of what they were doing away from that. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this question from Noel, do you think Japan are as competitive as they would like to be compared to the South Americans, European and African teams? I know in Asia they do very well. Yeah, that's a great question. And he's right. They're not. They answer the question unequivocally not. The problem in Japanese football is they're very, very good technically. And technique, the technical ability has gotten to them to where they are today. There's no doubt about it. But here's, the, here's what I tell people, and people will be shocked at this. The coaching in Japan, in this country, is quite low. It's quite low. In fact, especially at the elite level, the coaching in countries like Australia, England, of course, even the United States is much, much better than the coaching here. It's better than the coaching here. It's better than the coaching in Korea. So, but here's one for you. But we develop better players here in Japan, better players here technically than we do in America 
or also Australia. So you might scratch your head and think, well, well, how can that be? You just said that the coaching is better. And that's the point because coaching is rarely the uh, response. Basically kids that are good technically, that's rarely because of the coaching. Skill acquisition is rarely the result of coaching. It has to do with the culture. It has to do with what's happening away from the organized play. Just like in, in South America, there's no secret coaching sauce that's going on in, in South America, but yet the players are technically genius because culture is conducive to developing players like that. There's a big difference, man, between learning and teaching skills and coaching. There's a big, big difference. And that's why the Japanese are so good technically. Interesting. Uh, here's a question from Jay. It says, Tom, what is your thoughts on being comfortable on both feet? Is it better to be excellent on your stronger foot and just okay on your weaker foot? Do, do you think your weaker foot should be worked on to be just as good as your stronger foot? I think now I've got, it's interesting because both of my boys are quite two footed. Um, there's, it's rarely you'll find players that are two footed when it comes to shooting, but when it comes to ball manipulation or changing direction or, or, or turning or cutting, both of my boys are just as good with both feet. And so I am starting to believe now that that can be, you know, there's a question. Is it nature? Is it nurture? Are you born with it? Is it taught? Is it art? Is it science? And I think there are certain genetics, obviously, that come into play. But I think that you can nurture and encourage players to become two-footed from a very, very young age. But again, it starts very early. And again, that's an unconscious process, man. This is the part of the football world that these guys, that people don't understand. You know, and that is, is that the learning of those technical skills from a very, very young age of two, three, four years of age, that's like uploading those technical skills into your brain, into almost a hard drive that becomes unconscious. I saw with both my boys, here's a really interesting thing. I saw with both of my boys, they were very good technically doing things around the house, um, doing things with each other. But in the early stages when they were six or seven or eight years old, I wasn't seeing them use it so much out in, the, in, in, in games. And then I thought, well, this is a bit weird, but then something clicks. It's not as though they did anything different practicing, it clicked. So I can't explain exactly the neuroscience behind that, but it does go to show that those technical skills have been uploaded into the unconscious brain. And that's basically, they get used. Interesting. I've got a question for you. Um, so you, obviously you're working with a lot of cultures that maybe where football isn't a predominant sport. There's, a, there's maybe a lack of knowledge in the, in the parent base, if you like. What do you give the parents to help them, you know, ignite, as you say, at home? So if I'm a parent, you know, you're talking about, you know, cuts and changes directions and pullbacks. Maybe if I've never, you know, encountered football before, I might struggle with that. What yep. do you give them? Like, you know, do you give them, you know, your book, your handbook or, yeah. like, you know, good, something good, yeah. to support them with that? Yeah, it depends on who we're working with. I mean, if it's just a personal friend or someone contacts me, um, probably a little bit too accessible. Usually when people contact me asking questions, I'll send them some videos of my kids. I'll show them. I'll ask them what age you're, and I'll send some age appropriate thing. But obviously that's not scalable. But for example, the program we're doing in Houston, you can go to Houston's website and we have an entire football starts at home program, man. It's a almost idiot. It's idiot proof. It goes through and it gives everything. It, it tells the parents exactly why they're doing it. It's telling the pa parents what to do. It's showing the parents how to do it. We've got videos step by step. We've got a checklist, everything. It's all there. And I know only because I've done it that everything that I did with my kids, anybody could do. And those videos that I showed of some of the other kids that I used as examples, to show uh, the ball mastery, some of them, the parents have never played football ever. I've got a couple of friends. I've got a couple of kids that are so good. And those players, both those kids, sorry about this. They basically, their parents never played football. So again, it's not a very, it's not like a huge thick curriculum that you need. And that's why the entry level is so important because when you get the entry level, right. Okay. And a kid crosses over the line into organized play that's when they're actually coachable. That's when actually the guy or the woman with the, the D license or the F or the C or the B can actually coach. The problem is we got most coaches that are overqualified because the kids can't transfer the ball from the right foot to the left foot. So they can't do anything. 
And then the parents get frustrated because in many countries it's pay to play and they're paying hundreds or thousands of dollars and their kids are terrible. So that's, it's all connected. His question from Jordan, he says, uh, how do you address the social and cultural differences between Japan and Chinese children and North American children? Yeah, I mean, like, any, like, like than... anything, like anything, you know, you have to you have to understand what kind of culture you're in. You have to understand what's culturally acceptable. So for I'll give you a great example. In Japan, when a child is six years old and they join their first formal organized team, OK, it's sixth, first grade. It's culturally accepted. Do you know how many times a week they train? Four times a week. Four times a week, man, for a six, seven-year-old. How long do they train? Two and a half hours a session. Wow. Can you imagine that? On any given Saturday or Sunday, they could train half a day or play games all day long. And here's the kicker. There's no on-off season. It runs 52 weeks a year. So that's a cultural thing. So if you tried doing that in America or maybe even the UK with a six or seven year old, they'd probably put you in jail. It's not socially accepted, <laughs> right? With a kid. Now in, 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 in China, it's even worse. And I'm not advocating that that's a good system four times a week, two and a half hours, but that's the culture. Who am I, Tom Byer, to go in and tell the Japanese after 10,000 years of history or whatnot that you're doing it wrong. So that's one of those things where you have to kind of adapt to the, the way that the culture and you have to understand it. Um, here's another question. Just, I've lost it. I can't tell you who it's from. He said, is there a benefit of, of players, young players using training in bare feet rather than with shoes on at a younger age? I think that when we say training, I think and encourage people when they're doing the ball mastery with the little kids in around the house, it's much better to do it with no, uh, no shoes or socks on. So that's a good question. You grip better. Uh, safety wise, much, much more likely that the child's not going to slip or fall. Um, I've got wooden floors here. If kids run around with socks on the floor, like a three, four, five, six year old, they're going to fall probably. So, and, and also, and again, I'm not an expert in this, but I have read some things that something to do with the feel of the ball, you know, with the, with the, with the actual feeling of the ball to the foot, it's got some kind of benefits, but also too, it's much, much easier to pull the ball back. I, Again, here was another really interesting thing for me. You know, having worked in the Curver program for so, many, so long, I never really encouraged my sons to do a lot of the different movements that we have in the Curver curriculum. Step overs, scissors, slap, all of these. I basically had them focus on pulling the ball back a lot because I, I could see in the beginning that when you teach a child to pull the ball back, that it puts basically embeds in their conscious, their subconscious, the, uh, to protect the ball. Protecting the ball is one of the most important things that you can teach a child. And I'll give you an example why. So if you go to an American kid, Chinese kid, Australian, Canadian, I don't know, maybe even an English kid, and you give them a ball, and they haven't played football before, you give them the ball, and you challenge them for the ball as an adult, they're going to do one of three things. They're either going to kick the ball away and freeze, or they're going to kick the ball away and try to outrun you, or they're going to bend over and pick the ball up. Okay. Now you give a ball to the little kid from Brazil, Uruguay, Spain, Croatia, and you challenge them. You know what they're going to do nine out of 10 times. They're going to pull the ball back and turn their body. So just that little insight sets the whole tra different trajectory for development. And I'm saying this because I'm working with thousands and thousands of kids over the years. So I've seen the difference. I've seen kids literally out of diapers and seen what these kids have been taught, what they've practiced, what they've done. And I've seen players that have gone on to play in World Cup tournaments, man. So it's, that's, a, that's a very, very unique in, insight to see. You got to remember, a majority of player, coaches, especially senior coaches, they inherit the best players, man. They don't develop. They don't develop from the entry level. And in fact, to this day, I've never seen a presentation from any other coach in the world that shows me from entry level to the professional level. I've never seen it ever. I've never seen any coach do a presentation like that. They use, they use examples of kids that are already pretty good kids that they inherited. You know, so that's why what we're doing as well, we've got now hundreds and hundreds of video evidence, video library of kids from literally the first day that they've ever touched the ball. And we're seeing outcomes now. We're seeing they join teams. We see which players are the dominating players in the, in the game. 
And we also are correlating what kind of coaching are they getting? Are they getting some kind of magnificent top level coaching? More often than not, no. It's that they were good at the entry level and things manifest because when you get it right at the entry level, most problems cease to become problems because the kids are technically competent. Interesting. This question from Andre, he says, are there benefits Are there benefits to adding cognitive work when doing ball mastery, i.e. catch a tennis ball or look up and say a color or number? I think if anything, it, it might, I, I don't know because I've never, I've never done that. But the only thing I could think of, two things. Um, it's, 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 it's a big enough challenge for a small young kid to be doing anything with their feet to begin with. But I would say this. I would say it, it, it would probably be more fun for the child because I know my own kids too. They love to have different things happen. You know, kids love to, as soon as you throw a ladder out, kids want to run through the ladder, right? Or you, whatever you do, you, you put cones and a, and a, and a, and a bar and kids will want to run under it. You know, how many kids want to take turns playing goalkeeper? So I say, make sure that you're getting the ball mastery part, right? But from time to time, if you want to throw in some kind of cognitive, practice as long as it's you know you think it's age appropriate um why not i i i i'm a little bit cynical about stuff like that in terms of things i find a lot of it gimmicky and also yeah. a lot of time when it you, you, you also takes away from the ball mastery in some well that that's that was my said. first point so that's why yeah. for, so uh, that's why also i changed my whole thinking about juggling a ball and believe me, when I was a kid, I was an outstanding juggler. I actually have a video of me juggling the ball 10,000 times. So I was really into juggling because I thought that that's the way that you improved, right? And now I realize that juggling, it, by having said that, and here's a little bit of a, you know irony, with young kids, usually the best juggler will usually be the best player. But that's only really because you're showing that he's so committed and he plays with the ball a lot. But I would much rather have kids involved with, um, with ball mastery. And I always discourage my two boys from uh, practicing juggling until they were probably up around maybe 10, 11 years of age. I wanted them yeah, to have that foundational mastery. Yep. Yeah, it's a bit like, I said, like you said about kicking the ball. I find that a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, we do lots of ball mastery. We do juggling at the beginning of our sessions. And I say, well, actually, you know, arguably, are you really doing ball mastery? I think you're missing, yeah. a, missing, missing a trick. I think it's just one of those things uh, where people just don't know better. A lot of these things, man. I mean, even the scientists that come out with the, you know, the isolated training and all that. But again, hey, whatever works for them, let it happen. But I can just tell you, again, you know, like beating a dead horse, I've, I've worked with thousands and thousands of kids, man. And I've seen what it takes. I see the training. I see the kids that have come through our schools. And I see the kids that are selected for the elite programs that go on to play on World Cup te teams. They play on, you know, in on professional clubs. And I see the train they did. Japan is a great example of it. This country, if you're looking for a country that focuses on isolated training, it's right here, bro. This is where it is, man. And this is why we have a women's program that has less than 50,000 girls in the whole country that play. And they've won all three World Cup tournaments. Mm. So... I'm open-minded and I like to learn new things, but I'm just waiting for one of these coaches, these scientists to come and show me some of their outputs. I see the inputs, what they think should be done, but I'm showing and seeing inputs and I'm also seeing the outputs. So it's easy to correlate. Question here from Liam, two questions. You might say, are you, firstly, are you an advocate of cognitive psychology? And the second part of the question is, which, what is the, which is the highest profile player that has emerged as a result of these engaging in these methods? I'm, I'm big into psychology in general, but I'm much, much more into neuroscience and the way that the brain operates and the way, especially it has to do with technical development, because I've been involved in this collaboration now of the learning and teaching of skills, especially with very young kids. I was very lucky because Dr. John Rady, the foremost neuropsychiatrist in the world, wrote the forward and the afterward um, for, for our book, Football Starts at Home. And I'm involved in two research projects that he's involved with as well, with young kids. Um, so, yeah, I believe in it. Um, talking about the players, are you talking about experience from, my, from myself or just with any players? Which is the highest profile player that has emerged as a result of in these of engaging in these methods so 
I'm well, I can tell you a, a bunch of them. Aya Miyama, who I had since she was eight years old, who went on to become the captain of the Japan national team, won the World Cup tournament in 2011, won a silver medal at the London Olympics, and she was three times AFC Player of the Year and two times FIFA World Cup two games MVP. So that's one right there. And we've got lots of boys. Minami no, the boy who just signed for Liverpool, came to our school from the age of 6 to 12. So I've seen his progression along with his brothers. I've also seen Shinji Kagawa, who went to play for Manchester United. There's lots and lots of players. I can't even keep track of the players that we have in Japan that have come to our programs or somehow connected to our programs that are playing in, uh, in professionally or in the, uh, in the World Cup or in national teams, I'm sorry, or professionally. So lots. A question from Callum. Do you think it's necessary to have your coaching qualifications when providing technical training to young players? I think it always helps. I'm always one for, you know, education. But uh, I've, I put it this way. Again, not trying to be pr too provocative, but I've seen some really super good coaches that have been inexperienced with no coaching licenses. And I've seen coaches with coaching licenses that haven't done well and related to kids. So I, I, I would say that it's always, I'm never saying don't go out and get any kind of, kind of coaching credentials. I think that it's very important. But when you're working with very young players, I think it's much more important to be able to relate to the players, to the young kids. And, and I think the most important point of being a, a coach of young kids is being able to excite them, being able to excite them. Of course, you have to be knowledgeable about what it is that you're trying to teach the players. But for me, it really comes down to personality. Personality and that, to be honest with you, is one of the reasons why Japanese coaching hasn't done as well as it should do. Because, again, that's a whole nother conversation here. But it's a cultural thing as well. And they don't communicate as well as Westerners do with each other. There's a very strict hierarchy in Japan amongst the younger and older people. And they even speak in a different, not a different language, but a different uh, vocabulary that they, that they are expected to respond to when they're talking to an older person. So Japanese struggle a little bit when it comes to the communication. They're very good with learning the X's and the O's, they'll go in and they'll take a test and they'll do a training session better than you and I or better than most professional coaches would do, but they're, they're not good at presenting through excitement and being able to uh, uh, lead a group. And that's where Japan really kind of struggles. Interesting. Okay, last sure. couple of questions. It's on my accident, it's quite late in Tokyo there. Chat has a question. He says, what fun play or other or other cognitive engagement do you suggest to engage a child, particularly to not simply kick a ball? Well, again, you got to remember, man, I'm talking about the entry level. So these kids aren't even in teams yet. So the motive, and this is the part that people need to understand, the motivator for the kids is they see themselves getting better. So here's the, here's the kicker. When I was studying Neymar, okay, I started, re when I study players, I, I, I look for everything, interviews with the families, friends, everything. Neymar's father, this is exactly how I'll answer the question. Neymar's father said this. He said, people don't understand that in Brazil, kids don't fall in love with football. They fall in love with the ball. That's what happens, man. They fall in love with the ball, and that leads to falling in love with playing football. In most other countries in the world, we try to force the kids to fall in love with football and the ball gets in the way. And if you figure that out, man, half of your, half of your problem with development goes away because it's about the ball. So what I say is that my kids don't get bored, man. When you're talking about a two, three, four, five, six-year-old, what they're craving is the ball. They want the ball. They want the ball by themselves. They want to learn to do as many things that they can do with the ball. Now, if you're talking about crossing over the line into entry, into the entry level, at the competitive level, yeah, of course, there's lots of other things that you have to teach the kids, right? But up until the age of six, to me, getting them to fall in love with the ball and getting them to play with the ball as much as they can and learning. There's so many things you can do with the ball. I filmed a hundred and, get this, I filmed a hundred and twenty, a hundred and twenty different exercises, one player with one ball that you can do. Now, most people, you, you can because you're a technical coach, but most people can't imagine well, what the heck is that? So there's so many things that you can teach and you can learn and you can have fun doing with the ball. And that's, that's, that's my 
base or approach of, of teaching young kids. It, it, the goal is to try to get them to fall in love with the ball. Because then, once they cross over that line into organized play, like my kids, you should see. No touch, man. I don't do anything with my kids. I'm not that pushy father. In fact, I made a conscious decision to be very careful on what I do with my kids. I get my kids. My kids come to me and they ask. They 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 tell me why you don't try to teach. I I because I've passed I've t- passed them off, and I've seen that even with below average coaching, kids develop because my kids have developed into very very top players. They both were number ten. They're both captains of their team, and in Japan you get elected for that. It's not like the coach comes and says you know you're it. No, they actually have a vote and all the players. And now again. I'm not saying that my kids are the best kids in the world and they're going to be top professionals. And to be honest with you, I don't care. But as a parent, putting my parent hat on, I've done my job, man. I prepared my kids. I passed them off to you or to whoever it is and let them go and enjoy their football career. Last last question. Last, bit. What, what would your advice be for uh, uh, a parent who's got a young child at home then and they want to put this into practice? A few little takeaways which they can implement straight away maybe. Sure. First, number one, go get a small ball because it's a small child. That's the biggest mistake most people make is that they get a too big a ball, right? You got a size three, four, five. I'm talking about the little ball. I just, I think they're in the, they're in my other room. I've got several, but a small ball, a small ball. Size one, my, yeah, skill ball, right? I should have bought my tool, tools here. Um, mm-hmm. Size one. Second of all, I mean, you can go. I mean, if you you can you can always go to our YouTube page or whatever, or Houston Dynamo even. Basically, introducing these ball mastery skills, and the most basic one that I teach kids is is just pulling the ball back, right foot, left foot, just pulling it back. Just visualize. Well, I showed one of the slot. I showed one of the videos up there, so you've got it in the presentation here. It's just teaching the child to just co- make contact with the sole of their foot, right foot, just. Vision, vision this. You're in the living room. Pull the ball back. You can model it for them. The parents just need to model it. Pull the ball back. It might bounce off the sofa, bounce off something. But every time they make contact with the ball, try to get both the right and the left foot, but just pulling the ball back. Just pulling the ball back, man. Because you're just learning possession. You're learning to hold the ball. You're learning to control the ball instead of endlessly kicking it. Because the little kid's going to get tired of kicking if you're going to chase it, especially if you go outside. And then the next one is just trying to get them to stand still and do what we call the slide, where the ball is between the feet, right foot, left foot, right foot. It's a repetition. That's what we're looking for. You're looking to build those neural pathways, man, because the more that the cell fires, it wires with the other cells. That's how you create a neural pathway. So like Romeo was saying in his presentation, unless you've created those neural pathways, you can't go back into your subconscious or your unconscious mind and pull it out of like a a rabbit out of the hat. It has to be laid down already. And the only way they can do that is by doing it in a stable, what they call stable environment. It can't be an unstable environment. It has to be done because the more that you repeat the movement, the stronger the, the uh, neural pathway is. Very important. That's why repetition is so key. And, and finally, tell us where, where everyone can pick up your fantastic book, Football Starts at Home, if they haven't already. Sure. Um, we can, we're going to have to switch over to the American word soccer. And basically... You can go online and there's a, it's pretty simple. Soccer starts at home book. Soccer starts at home book. One long word dot com. And you can order the book online there. You can order the book online there. And what if some people want to find out more, find out more about you and your work as well and contact yeah, you or anything like that, your the, social channels. The, the, there's, like there's quite a bit of information on there. I mean, if they want to check out also, I think, to be honest with you, the Houston Dynamo page is very, very good the way that they did it. And that's a pretty easy one. That's a HoustonDynamo.com and then a slash soccer starts at home. I can send them to you and you can bet. But that's a very, very, very good platform. Cool. And it, it gives everything. And just obviously they can follow you on Twitter as well. You got, you're big on Twitter as well. You're, you're yeah, it's just there, right? Uh, yeah, Tom Tomson 106. So T O M S A N 106. And I do actually reply. Lovely. Recommend with, with DM me. <laughs> there you go. There you go, guys. Well, look, Tom, thanks very much for your, for your uh, time. I know it's late in the evening there, Tokyo. I appreciate it. It's been fantastic. Really great insight. 
and yeah looking forward to chatting to you again very soon um thanks everybody for joining us appreciate it uh, we're back next weekend with another couple of webinars but uh thanks very much and tom thanks again mate and i'll see you thank soon. you